and oh, someone is like top, top, topping. It's really annoying. I'm trying not to be pissy and in a pissy mood today because I know that people love it, like my channel because I'm upbeat and happy but right now I'm just feeling really irritated. Sorry if it comes through on the video. Stop topping your stupid thing. Nobody cares. Ugh, what is it with projects in the springtime? I can't even get my thoughts together. It's so annoying. I don't think it's going to stop anytime soon. Just keep it a real for y'all. So I'm sitting back. I'm going to be sitting back and just doing a little fireside chat with Jess. Some books that I read in April. Part one. I'm always nervous to give an unpopular opinion. it's me Jess welcome to another video if you are new to my channel thank you so much for checking it out and I guess I would encourage as most people do you to subscribe for more videos and hit the like button yeah I think that's what we're supposed to say so there I've said it I've done my promotion for today so I'm doing a part one and a part two for April as I did for March I just think that this format works really well for me and I think it may means that I can create digestible content. First book I'm going to talk about is probably the most popular book on YouTube right now. Could it be the most popular book in the world right now? Potentially. It's Steaming Copperhead by Barbara King Silver. I have never read anything by Barbara King Silver, so this was my first read by her and I'm just going to be reiterating what so many other people are saying here. I don't know how much I have to add to the conversation. You will not be disappointed if you pick up and read this book. It's fantastic. The character of Demon Copperhead modeled on uh, Charles Dickens's David Copperfield is such a strong character and narrator in the story that it's impossible I think to say too many negative things about the book. The negative things that I've heard are it's too much like David Copperfield, that it's too much like David Copperfield which was not an issue for me because I haven't read David Copperfield although I'm familiar with the story of David Copperfield. So for the first part of this novel I kept thinking oh I wish I was reading David Copperfield. I guess I kind of wonder if Barbara Kingsolver had expected that kind of criticism because I think the, the main criticism as I said is that it's too much like David Copperfield. I don't know if she cares. Uh, I mean, I don't know if it matters is what, what I guess I mean. But I had heard, I did this as a buddy read with Laurie and Laurie was mentioning that there was an essay in her copy of the book uh, that described uh, Barbara Kingsolver's inspiration for writing the book. That she had been inspired to write Dr. David Copper, a demon copper heads uh, while she was in the UK visiting a place where Charles Dickens had been writing and perhaps had even written. David Copperfield and that was where she got the inspiration for the book to write a modern day uh, retelling and so that was sort of interesting. The only things that I, so here are the things that I think were fantastic about the book. First of all her writing is amazing. The fact that she was able to give this character this very well-developed voice and I think other people have been saying the same thing is pretty astonishing and be and been able to really express uh, his experience in a way that is completely believable completely believable I don't know how she did this yes but the whole so the, the story is about Demon Copperhead who is a boy living in the Appalachian region of the US and he is the child of a woman who and I don't think I'm spoiling anything but he loses his mother and he ends up in the foster care system and he I mean ultimately I won't say how it ends for Demon because I think a big reason why readers were so enjoyed the book so much is because they're so invested in Demon's character and I get that. It, I, I, it worked for me as well. I, I will say that I personally found the plot points 
very predictable. Nobody else, I don't think, has talked about that. And it's not that I want plot points to always be unpredictable, but I don't know, there's something about seeing it coming, which is kind of like, okay, here comes the part that I knew was coming. That's about the only negative thing I could say about it is that it just was very predictable. I do think that she, as other people have said, has done, has just been able to take the same issues that were such a big part of social commentary in David Copperfield and bringing them into the modern day context, albeit with different concerns and circumstances, in particular the opioid crisis and her ability to shine a light on the problems, the holes in the system with education, with the uh, social security net and with the medical system are really undeniable. But as a reader, just for a story with a plot, I did find it a little bit predictable and dare I say, slightly boring as a result. The writing is fantastic. The voice is fantastic. I don't know how that could have been improved. I think for me, the cast of characters was so varied and diverse. There was a part of me that wanted to hear more from the other, more about the other characters and maybe a little bit less about Demon, just because I was just, I don't know, I just got, I was just a little bit bored. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I do appreciate what a great book it was. And I think that most people really, really enjoy it. Um, and I, I, yeah, that's sort of where I'm at with Demon Copperhead. But I really loved it. And like, I loved Demon, the character. I really did. I just thought that the plot was lacking. That's all. Yeah, just thought the plot was a little boring. That's all. That's Demon Copperhead. Okay, so the next two books that I want to talk about, two memoirs that I read this month that I was inspired to read through the People April reading challenge that was created by Roz and Elizabeth. I'll leave the links to their channels below. For People April, I read Sarah Polly's memoir, Run Towards the Danger. And I did do a whole reading vlog where I read this book and women talking. So if you're new to my channel, you might wanna check that out. This is a set of six essays that Sarah wrote about various different experiences in her life. It's fascinating. I say that because she was a child actor. She's a Canadian, now a Canadian writer and director. She just has a way of imparting those experiences, which is like, she's very talented. And the way that she writes is very engaging. And she does write in a couple of different styles in the different essays. So I really appreciated that. Some are more confessional, some are a little bit more artistic. And so I really appreciated that. And I, I just thought it was, she dealt with a lot of topics that are difficult, that she was obviously grappling with that are quite difficult to talk about. Things like why she didn't come forward during uh, the sexual assault case of Gian Gameshi. She also writes about neglect, being neglected as a child. She writes about the way child actors are treated on set and her experiences as a child actor and what was expected of her. She also writes about other um, areas of stigma, particularly having to do with women and healthcare as a new mother, and then later on after having received a concussion. And she, she also writes about how sometimes when you have something like a concussion or you have some, some kind of illness that isn't obvious, it's sometimes people don't believe you, sometimes even members of her own family didn't believe her. So she was writing, she's writing about really difficult stuff. Um, but really important stuff that she's grappling with and that maybe might affect other people. So it was it was helpful to read that for me personally because I saw a lot of my own experiences, not in, so much with the child acting because I was never a child actor, but more so to do with later life in the medical system. Uh, it was nice to see some of those feelings reflected in someone else's experience. 
and to learn about her experiences that were different from mine as well. So I, I highly recommend this book. It's always hard to talk about people's true memoirs, right? Their true life stories, which brings me to Consent by Vanessa Springura, or actually originally titled Le Consentement, uh, translated from the French, and it's translated by Natasha Lehrer. And this is, was a really, I found this to be a really, really difficult read. Just very hard to read. I found it very hard to read personally. It was, it's a sort of a confessional uh, story. Uh, I read an interview where Spinora describes it as being like a message in a bottle. So she's writing about her experiences as a 14 year old girl being in a relationship with a 50 year old man who she met at a party with her where her mother her mother took her to this party and this man was there and he basically uh, in literary circles in France and he groomed her and she ended up in an affair with him thinking it was a consenting affair thinking that she was in love with him but she was a 14 year old girl so retrospectively so the first part of the book is written just more like a diary more like a um, an ex not an explanation, but a recounting of her experience of being in love with this 50 year old man as a 14 year old girl. And then the second half, and just being really uh, an enamored of, of this person and this person being, you know, a literary genius and her being like an ingenue and being his inspiration and her reflecting on that and writing about that experience. And I think that what was really difficult about it and revealing about it is that it makes you realize, I don't know if anybody can remember being 14 years old, but as a 14 year old, you are idolizing adults for the most part. You are seeking attention from adults. She was also abandoned by her father, which contributed to her maybe being more susceptible to this grooming. Uh, and her mother kind of condoned it. Uh, and at the time, sort of philosophically, it was a time where there was this whole idea of sexual liberation and, and it was really supported by the system around her. And she describes that really well in the book. I would say the second half of the book is more of an essay style, kind of talking more about that time and about the system and about maybe a little more critically about the institutions that supported that within society, including recounting of when he was almost arrested, this man, and just didn't end up getting arrested. <laughs> and everybody sort of just looked the other way. So I think this was a very, I mean, I know this was a very big case in France at the time when the book was published. Vanessa Springora is the head of a publishing company. And I think because she's come so far in her career, she felt that she could, I think, so what happened was is that the, the author was up for an award or, or something and that was the triggering point for her to write this. It was well worth my time. What I discovered when reading this book is that it's actually a book that's assigned to students in Cégep here. I teach in a Cégep here. Uh, Cégep is the two years between high school and university in Quebec. So it's when students are 17 and 18 years old and this was a book club pick for my book club and one of the parents chose it because it had been assigned in her son's class, one of her son's classes. So I thought that was really interesting because it seemed pretty heavy. But at the same time, I was happy that it was assigned because I think it's an important conversation. This man was a pedophile and this man promoted pedophilia. And immediately after the book was published, they, I think in France, they implemented the age of consent at 15, where there was no age of consent before as a result. Yeah, the article that, the same article where I got the line about uh, message in the bottle, which is the New York Times, uh, yeah, the New York Times article, it does say, uh, in France, sexual relations between adults and minors under the age of 15 are illegal, but there is no set age of consent, which permits a lighter penalty than rape. Springora asks us what this consent is supposed to look like. What did her teenage self think she was consenting to? How did the experience of adult violence control and manipulation shape her desires? So it's, that is the kind of tone of the book. Uh, but there's no question that look, in her writing, looking back, that she, it was a complete 
it was an environment where she would never not cons probably wouldn't not consent if that makes sense the result i mean this is why these telling these stories is so important as difficult as they may be i, I admire her for being able to have written have written this because she had to relive a lot of it and re-examine her role and it's obviously set, cast a shadow over her entire life. But it does say that after the publication of Consent, prosecutors opened a case against um, Matt Sneff, who is the author. He was dropped by his three publishers and stripped of a lifetime stipend. The man had a lifetime stipend. This week, the government announced it would instate 15 as the age of consent by every, and then it says by every conceivable metric, the book is a triumph. So if you can stomach it, <laughs> you could read this. Uh, I'm glad I read it. There were moments where I wanted to stop reading it. I really did have a difficult time. I had to force myself to go back to it. It was a hard book to read. Oh. I had fun this month. <laughs> I had a good time this month. Fun times. So I'm going to talk about three more books for this wrap-up and then I'm going to do a part two for the wrap-up because it seems to be the pacing of a video that I like. I've already mentioned that, haven't I? The next book I'm going to, that I read in uh, April that I wanted to talk about is Science Proceeding the End of the World by Yuri Herrera. This is translated by Lisa Dillman. This is a story about Makina who crosses the border from Mexico into the U.S looking for her brother who had previously crossed the border because he was trying to claim land that they believed to be in their family or owned by them. My daughter recommended this book to me and one of the things she said to pitch it to me was that she felt that Yuri Herrera had done such a fantastic job of writing the character of Makina and giving Makina writing in this female voice, this young female voice, and I couldn't agree with her more. It's fantastic. The way that he describes her fears as a young girl traveling in a foreign land, and also the fears that she has for her safety as an, as an illegal immigrant crossing the border, but specifically the fears that she has as a woman. It's pretty insightful and pretty incredible. And he deals with a lot of other issues in the story as well. I won't say how the story ends, uh, but McKenna has to deal with some shady characters in order to get across the border and to help her find her brother. And she also has to encounter an entirely different culture from her own by herself. Uh, and it really explores different ideas of assimilation and immigration and all kinds of different ideas. And it's a very, it's a very sad book. I found it sad, uh, but impactful. It's so thin and it does so much so well. Uh, it's one of those books where you want to underline every single sentence because every sentence is in, in just dripping with meaning. <laughs> and for that reason, I would really recommend this book. I hadn't heard of it. It's definitely been around for at least five, six, seven years. I just hadn't heard of it and was very grateful for the recommendation. And then I kind of switched gears and veered off my April TBR and I went to the library and picked up Fever Dream by Samantha Schweblin. Hope I'm saying her name correctly. This was a very fast read for me. I think I did read, the, both of these were very fast reads. Like you could read them each in one sitting. This is a more of a horror creepy story about a woman who is experiencing, she's dying. Uh, but I didn't really realize that she was dying until like quite late in the book. So I hope I'm not giving anything away. But I think most of the synopses do describe it as she's in a hospital and she's dying. And it's just very well written. It's a translated work as well. Translated, I think, also from the Spanish by Megan McDowell. It just, it it's this woman's experience of kind of falling in and out of consciousness and communicating with what might be a demon or a ghost. It's got super creepy vibes and it's just so well written. 
in terms of creating that dream space. And we've all been in it where you're in a dream and you're like holding on to a rope and then the rope turns into a snake or something like things shape shifting. You think you saw something in that corner and it's in the other corner or you thought you were speaking to someone and it turns out there's someone else or you thought you're speaking to someone and they're speaking to you like all of these different warped versions of a reality are there in the dream the structure of it is that she's talking to another character a boy named david uh, that's how it's structured. And so there is a conversation going back and forth where David is asking her to describe things to him. And I think David is a ghost or an evil spirit. Although I don't know, at the end of it, I wasn't sure. We know that she is not David's mother because she has her own daughter who she's very concerned about throughout the dream, a young girl. And so you have this feeling like something bad's going to happen to the little girl and bad things do happen to animals and then eventually to others. And it's just a creepy, it was just a really creepy novella and I thought it was very good. I think some people have trouble with it because it's very confusing and, I, and some people have criticized it for feel it, that feeling like, I don't know what the hell is going on in this book. And I did feel like that through most of it, but it held my attention in the way that it was written. I just kept, it kept me reading because I was like, what's going on here? And, and also the atmosphere, I was able to be in that atmosphere and be kind of really creeped out. And I was enjoying that. So I definitely recommend this. I know she has a couple of other books out that I would like to pick up at some point. All right, so we've come to it. The last book I'm going to talk about is one that I finished this week that I've been wanting to read and talked about, and that would be Burnham Wood by Eleanor Catton. I have not read The Luminaries, so I did try to read The Luminaries, but I was, I just gave up. Anyway, we're not here to talk about The Luminaries. We're talking here to talk about Burnham Wood. I'm still trying to figure out how I feel about Burnham Wood because it was not a, it was not a, an amazing I love this book read for me by any stretch but I also don't agree with the criticisms of it being extremely slow in the beginning I didn't have the same feeling and it's I wonder if it's because I'd watched a couple of reviews and kind of prepared myself for it to be a slow read in the beginning I actually really enjoyed I, I really enjoyed Eleanor Catton's writing I think that she is masterful at creating these in-depth characters. In this story, there is a main relationship between a woman named Mira and another woman named Shelley, who the two women who are central to the organization called Burnham Wood. Burnham Wood is an organization that it's kind of a guerrilla grassroots, reclaiming the land, planting on unused lands, uh, for the good of communities and others. Uh, that's the nature of it. It's, it's modeled after socialist <laughs> group that makes all of its decisions by, you know, everybody has a vote and everybody votes and that's how we make decisions in this type of organization and this kind of utopian idea of how human beings could operate and divide resources and use resources. So that relationship is set up from the beginning. Then another character is introduced named Tony, who was part of Burnham Wood in the early years and has come back, but is trying to make a career for himself as an investigative reporter, as a journalist. And he is more of a radical. So he has a very radical view of Burnham Wood and... The situation that Burnham Wood is in or gets itself into during, over the course of the story. So as the story goes, there's been a landslide and Mira goes to explore the area where there was this landslide called Thorndike. And she's thinking that this would be a great place for them to set up some kind of crop or some kind of, to use the land in some way. 
And as she's scouting it out, she bumps into, runs into Robert Lemoyne, who is the billionaire who is also looking at the same land. We later find out that it's him who's caused the landslide, but I don't want to give too much away of the plot. Uh, and so they run into each other and he decides or offers, he wants to know more about Burnham Wood and he offers to fund their operations. And all of this is on land that is actually owned <laughs> by a couple uh, named Owen and Lady Darvish who haven't actually sold the land to uh, Robert Lemoyne, but he pretends that it has been sold to him when he's speaking with Mira. So Mira has to go back to the community at Burnham Wood and pitch them this idea of, oh, this billionaire wants to fund us. And so we have the setup of these two ideologies and there's a, a really long meeting where Tony is in attendance, where there's a lot of debate. <laughs> I'll just put it that way. And then the plot kind of moves on from there at that point. And it gets faster after that. But I, and I'm not, I don't want, as I said, I don't want to give anything away from the plot, but I, this is my first time reading Eleanor Catton. And I just, I don't think that this book is not without its flaws. I, I think that she did, I think that her creation of the characters of Mira and Shelley and their interaction is phenomenal. Uh, the way that they, they are kind of frenemies and they're jostling for power. And Shelley has, a, well, Mira is the founder, but Shelley is the doer. And Shelley has all this resentment towards Mira. And it's just very, very well, I think, well written, those two characters and that dynamic. And then the plot take, took a lot of turns that I didn't see coming, which I really enjoyed. So it was strange because it was literary and dealing with these really important big ideas that we need to be worrying about, like <laughs> billionaires running the world versus collectives running the world. <laughs> and the exploration of personal interests within the context of all of that and is it even possible for a collective to operate without people's personal interests getting in the way that was a topic that came up that i thought was really interesting technology is explored a lot in this book and then there's the thriller the plot itself and the twists and turns of because there is a murder and there or there is a death and there is a cover-up of sorts and then there are characters who you think are potentially in danger and we don't know how it's all going to end i will say the ending is kind of crazy i mean the ending of this book is bananas it's crazy i'm still thinking about the ending and i'm still trying to like i know what Eleanor Catton's doing with the ending and I understand what her commentary is in terms of the story being a reflection of our times and the bigger issues that she's addressed through this thriller <laughs> story. But that's all I'm going to say for it na for now. I, I think it's definitely worth picking up, definitely worth reading. I'd love to hear what other people think about it. I'd love to talk to some other people about the ending, <laughs> but I don't want to ruin it for anyone who hasn't read it yet. There are some flaws, like I said. I do think that she picks up a lot of different threads in this book and she doesn't complete them. So it does suffer a little bit of leaving us hanging with some of the plot points and some of the uh, also some of the ideas. Uh, so that I think could have been cleaned up. I think maybe the only way that it could have been cleaned up would have been though to make it longer. And I, so I guess it's just suffering from one of those things where she's trying to maybe do too many things all at once. And I, like I said, I haven't read the Illuminaries, so I don't know. So I don't know how this was handled by her as an author in the past. I think that's the big flaw of this book, but I wait for everyone out there to read it and let me know what you think, because <laughs> I'm curious. <laughs> So yeah, I think definitely worth a read and not as slow in the beginning as people complain, in my opinion. That's it for the first half of my wrap up for April. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye everyone. Y'all, I'm a little tired. <laughs> the end of the semester is getting to me and I do feel a little not myself, a little tired. Done, made a lot of videos lately, so I'm feeling a bit, I'm not gonna say burnt out on YouTube, but just feeling a little tired. Like when I sat down today, I thought, I don't really feel like talking about books, and I don't really feel like making a video. But here we are, nonetheless. Let's hope it goes well.
of a woman who uh, dies of an overdose. She dies of an overdose, right? I don't know. Was he a ghost? We don't know, do we? Thank you.